muted that you need to? I don't have you muted. You're you're in. So, sorry, I meant like uh, for, so for my starting soon screen, everything is muted. Oh well, that's fine. I can do this. See, you and I can talk now, but there's nothing going through the output. I think. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Alrighty. So, because I also want to check. Oh no! <laughs> I hear us. Yeah. No, I I hit a button. Oh, okay. All right. So it's only it's only ten seconds. No problem. It's okay. I hear myself too. I'm I'm very casual. <laughs> I can do music though. <laughs> Woo! Welcome to Perspectives in Tech. Yep. No, but we can just we can right, chit, so we can chit chat while you go tell people to show up. You got it. So we are currently live, everyone. This is Don Jones. Howdy. And uh, I'm I'm gonna go to all of the places and tell everybody that we are currently streaming. So on tonight's stream, I I reached out to Don and I asked if um. Like, how is it that he's so prolific because I'm sitting here and I consider myself like a kind I think that I think that that authors come in two uh, two types. There's like the prolific kind that can just like type a whole book in a week. And then there's a type like me, which is uh, very constipated and it <laughs> takes like two years to write two thirds of a book. So I asked Don, how was it um, that like, I wanted to see his style. I wanted to see the way that he podcasts or sorry, that he, uh, that he writes. And uh, he proposed that we do this live stream and I'm going to go tweet all about it. Did you have anything you wanted to say for a little bit? Don, no, I don't know if I should just get a bunch of my book. I, like I've got this whole, it's on my camera. We'll we'll see what people ask for in the chat. You can tell me. I've, I've, I actually I actually have copies of nearly every book I've written back here. Oh yeah, it's like my my brag shelf of my bookcase with, and you look at some of these and like I we used to sell tech books by the pound, and some of these are <laughs> some of these are freaking huge. Like this this has got to be like an inch and a half thick book. And even looking back, I I, I, I can't believe I wrote the whole damn thing. Move my chair. What's your, out of my... What's your largest book? Um, Man. you know the Are biggest. Are those all of your books? Yeah. That's a huge amount. Oh my god. Yeah, that's not all of them. I've I've done more. I, these are the non-powershell ones. So this is probably the eh, probably this one's a little bit bigger. This is the the giantest. I mean, this is. This has got to weigh like three pounds. Whoa, commerce server. Did that yeah. turn to biz talk? Uh, it did. Sort of. This was, commerce server was basically a giant API kit. Yeah, this is like 775 pages. This is ginormous. I don't think I could write a book that big anymore. I got. How, I, many, how long did that take? Um. <laughs> You're going to get really upset if I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it was like two months. Oh, my God. Oh. So the, 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 the first two years I was independent, I, I went independent Christmas uh, 2000. So I got laid off. And I went independent, and I finished writing my first book. And then for the next two years, I wrote six books a year. Because I was just I was living off the advances that the publishers used to pay back then. So I mean I was I was extremely motivated to, <laughs> to write books really fast. It's true. I mean this isn't my full time job, but I I wonder. I guess if I mean I have a lot of time off, and I'm still and I still don't. But there is the pandemic. But even before then, yeah, there's just I I can't. I don't know what it is that can get me prompted and into there. I'm still writing up the tweet. Sorry, everybody. No, it is not potato. Oh, let's see. Hey, Daniel. Uh, this is Don Jones. 
He's a guest <laughs> live streamer. He wrote all those books in the back. Tech books. Okay, I'm almost done with my tweets. And let me retweet that through my other thing. Yay. Boom. And then I have one more place to announce it. Actually, two more places. I can't believe you wrote all of those books. So a book every two months. Yeah, so those are the non-PowerShell ones. I've got another section of PowerShell off on the side. I don't know if that's in the frame or not. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's... that's pro I've written like 50 or 60 books total. I mean, it just, it's, I think like... that would take me, see if it's two, that would take me 120 years so far. <laughs> I was super, All super right. motivated because I, 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 I didn't have a job. I mean, the first book I wrote was Microsoft.net e commerce server, and I was writing that at the same time. Um, I had been hired to write a high school textbook on .NET framework programming that had to be written in a way that the teacher didn't have to know anything about programming. And so I, that's that's all I did all day. Like that was the sum total of of my income aside from what Chris made. Fortunately, he was at a bank at the time writing mortgages, and the bonuses on those is what kept us going. Oh, awesome! Yeah. All right, cool. All right, we have it. We have it out at every um, in all of the places. Yay! And. We could start talking. So, so what do you imagine for this live stream? Well, you're are you about to write the? Uh, you're going to write a novel with us. I Let's mean, you're going to talk about the. I mean, I can. Story. We can talk about the fiction writing. I, I've I've also you know I've got that new soft skills book out, and I've I pulled up the original outline that I did for that, and yes. the outline that I'm actually going to write, or I've already written it. Um, you know, writing for me is all about the outlining. It, it's it's one hundred percent the outlining. I think by the time I was doing, I'm scanning the book titles here. I think about the third book I did, I I was one thousand percent about outlining. I would I would break an outline. You know, so for me, a, a good tech book, a chapter of text, pure text. Take out screenshots, take out code samples, take out the little warnings and notes and all the other bullshit they put in a, a text chapter for me should be no longer than about 15 pages, which is actually not that long. And, mm -hmm. and once I kind of have that in mind, so 15 pages in Word, you get about six, 800 words a page. So, you know, do the math on that. Um, that that's about what it takes a human being an hour to read, right? So if you, if you work in the average reading speed of an adult human being, it works out to between 12 and 15 pages per hour in a printed book. So I don't like a chapter to be any longer than that um, because I, I, I like people to have a nice time bound experience. Like they can sit down for an hour, they can read, they can learn something. They, they learn something useful at the end of it. And then maybe the next day they go on to the next one. Or if they've got time, maybe they read another one, but, but there, there's a time bound there, right? I don't want to, you know, throw someone into a 50 page chapter because it's, it's too much. So once you kind of adopt that as your, your working unit, you start outlining around that and you figure out, okay, here's what each chapter needs to cover. And you start to triage, right? If that's your bound, you're like, well, geez, I mean, there's no way I can cover all this. Well, then it's too much. You've got to break it down more. Now it gets longer when you add the screenshots and code samples and all that. That's fine. But that's, that's not like cognitive load on a reader. So like here, pick mm -hmm. this. I'm going to, I'm going to, this is the original outline for what was going to be called master your technology career. This is the one I'm doing with, with Manning. Um, this is the mm -hmm. replacement for be the master. And this, this is probably a 600 page book. It's freaking massive. It's, it's way too big. I wound up getting into a lot of arguments with my editor, God bless her. Um, I probably need to send her <laughs> something really nice when this book is done. But so, you know, I've got this like, okay, part one, and then there's some very preachy stuff here. And then um, define your career plan. That probably should have been first because that's the first substantive thing here. 
Um, part two, exploring your job options. Um, part three, owning and maintaining your career. Part four, um, this just, just, just goes on and, on and on. Part four, embracing the modern job hunt. Um, part five, the critical soft skills you need, which weirdly, the book is supposed to be about soft skills. And here we are, and it's part five, and I'm finally getting to the point, right? Um, part mm -hmm. six, understanding businesses. Part seven, career level ups, like being a better teacher and a better leader. 35 freaking chapters in this book. Wow. It's massive. And I was getting into a ton of arguments when we were going back and forth through the, uh, through the, the dev edit process. And I was struggling to find the storyline here. And it really, really was bugging me. And it created a lot of grief because she was trying to find a storyline and trying, she said, well, it seems like this is the theme. I'm like, no, that's not the theme. I don't know what the goddamn theme is. There's no theme. <laughs> and, and I realized that like, this is the worst book outline I've ever written. And I got so ahead of myself because I'm so used to being good at outlining. And this is very high level. Like I, I, this is not the, the full detailed version because the full detailed outline is probably 30 pages. But wow. I realized I was so far ahead of myself and I was, I, this was almost like a mind map. And I've seen a lot of people use mind maps and I abhor them. I hate them. It's just like this. It's a scatter chart of shit, I think. And somehow that's supposed to come together into a cohesive story. And so I, I, I took a full week and I, I actually told them, I said, you know what? I don't want to write the book. Cancel the contract. I'm done. I'm, I'm out of here. Uh, Cause I was so frustrated and I haven't been that frustrated and writing is usually easy for me. And so I, I, I like got spoiled and I didn't know how to deal with it like an adult. So I took like a week off and I said, okay, look, what, what is it? Who is it that I'm trying to talk to here? Who's the audience? What's their life situation? What's their work situation? I said, I want this to be useful for someone who's just getting into tech and needs to think about this, this whole career they've, they've got, got ahead of them. And I want it to be useful for somebody who's been in tech for a little while and, and you know, maybe still has a bunch of career ahead of them. And we were sitting down at, at dinner time and I, I told Chris, I said, I'm really having trouble with this. He says, well, what is it about your career that you feel you did wrong? Which is a valid question because teaching... Teaching is not an attempt to prevent someone else from making your mistakes. Teaching is a way of you conveying those mistakes to them so that they can maybe make those mistakes better than you did, right? You can't, you can't stop people making mistakes. We're all going to make, it's the only way our brains learn. I said, well, you know, it, I think what, what, if I had to take like a meta level of what I've screwed up in my career and what I would love and this is another thing. A, a book can only fix one or two things. Like it takes a long time to fix one or two things in our heads. You can really only teach one or two like meta high level things. I said the high level thing, if I could have one thing that they, they took away is I felt like my whole career was this rat race and I was never satisfied with where I was at and it, it felt like I accomplished so much, but then I would look and somebody else had accomplished so much more and I, I realized, you know, what poor life choices I'd made. And I, just, I don't want people to feel that way. It's not necessary to feel this way. You know, I finally had this epiphany some years ago that I, I made it to where I needed to make it. And it doesn't matter if someone else did more. This is where I needed to be. He says, well, okay, that's your theme. He said, what if your book doesn't talk to that? I'm like, well, this whole, you know, what kind of company should you work for? It doesn't freaking matter. Um, this whole section on, on, uh, job hunting. Like, I'm, <laughs> what do I have in here? Um, part four, embracing the modern job hunt. Chapter 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. That's six, wow. six chapters. Six chapters. I'm going to cover the modern job hunt in a meaningful way in six chapters. No, I'm not. This is just going to be a shallow skim. Other people have done this better. Take it all out. So I just, I, I cut all that. Uh, I said, you know, part of what's bothering me on this is that there's not a lot of verbs. It, it, it doesn't feel, you know, understanding is a terrible verb. I, I can't look at you and tell if you're understanding something. Understanding a thing doesn't, doesn't bring you anything. Um, you know, business math and terminology for technologists. Yeah, that's stuff you need to know. It's stuff I want to teach you. But is this the right narrative for it? Is this the place where that really, really belongs? And so I, I threw the whole thing away. And I started over with this one. And I said, I want to focus this just on owning your 
career, understanding what a career is for, what it's supposed to do for you, when you've had enough, when to tell that you've had enough, and, and what are some of the things that we all need to make a career successful that, that isn't coding or building servers or whatever else. And so it's instead of 35 chapters, it's like 20 short chapters. This is about a 300, 350 page book. And it's, it's about owning your career plan. It's building and maintaining a brand. It's networking. And, and this isn't even the final table of contents because I went back later and I redid all these chapters so that the first, first word in every one is a gerund. It's a, it's a word that ends in ing. Being part of a community, keeping your, it's a verb. You know, it's, it's active. It's here's how to do this thing. And once I narrowed that in, like you can see, I started doing some, some page count estimates. I'm like, this is going to be about 10 pages and 16 pages and, and in there. And, and, and this is just what I'm going to limit myself to because this is, for me, the relative importance of this topic. And once I started doing that, it got, it got easier. It got like, I, I had a bright line. And so then I would take some of these things. So, you know, um, like working remotely or managing your time or showing up as a professional, like any of these things, I can kind of sit down and start, I can start bulleting that out a little bit. So managing your time. Well, the first thing is, you know, uh, where does the existing time go? Like, how do you already spend your time? What, what's your time inventory? And I'll literally just start making some notes like this. Okay, so once I know where my existing time goes, um, I need to triage how I spend my time. All right, so I know how I'm doing it. If, if I don't feel I'm managing my time well, okay, let's start at what I am managing it on, and let's start taking out things that I don't feel add value. So I'm going to triage how I spend my time. Um, and then scheduling my time to keep myself on track. And then there's some different techniques I can, you know, there's the Pomodoro technique, there's a couple others that I've got, so I'll, I'll pull those in. Uh, and then, you know, once I've done that, it's also about revisiting. Make sure you revisit your schedule because you you want to make sure that that you're doing the right thing, right? It's it's Life is agile. You've got to iterate. So you can't just do a thing and then stick with it forever. You've got to periodically revisit that and reevaluate what you're doing. And like I only wanted this to be about 10 pages, I've got four main bullets here. I'm going to get about two pages a piece out of those. So I really, I, I don't need to, okay, so now I need to break these down a little bit, but not a bunch, right? So time inventory. Um, I use a, a time flip. So talk about that. Talk, talk about the time flip, about how I use that to inventory. Um, some other techniques for people who don't want to buy a time flip device, that's fine. Um, you know, acknowledging that reality is reality, so this is like, you're going to waste time. You're going to be on YouTube or Facebook or whatever. It's, it's all about um, limits. It's about moderation. And so now that I've started to break these things down, like there's, you know, there's a couple, pa a couple paragraphs about a time flip. There's a, you know, three or four paragraphs about some other techniques. Uh, a couple paragraphs about talking like it's, it's okay to take a break. Like you don't have to drive yourself super hard. And now I can go, so here, here's my technique. I will, I will outline the crap out of a book. I mean, I will outline it to death. I will outline it until someone dies. And I might have a 30 page outline for a 300 page book. But by the time I'm done, every single one of my last level bullet points is really just a handful of paragraphs. And so Let's say I had done chapter seven. Now, I outline the entire book. I have to outline the book because it's the only way I know that I'm talking about all the things I wanted to talk about. And as I'm going through here, if there are things I realize that, you know what, this just isn't going to fit, I have to make a decision here. I'm going to put that into another document and maybe that'll be another book further down the line. I need to stay on story. I need to stay on mission. I need to accept the fact that I can't write all the things in one book. There's no such book that covers all the things. So now that I've, I've outlined this thing, okay, you know, it's, it's Monday night. I'm planning to write chapter seven tomorrow. So before I go to bed, I read this outline, just chapter seven. I read chapter seven's outline. I think about it. Ooh. I think, okay, you know, the time flip, I want to talk about that definitely. Oh yeah, these other techniques, I've written those down here. I know what I'm going to talk about there. And then I go to bed and I let, I let my brain 
do its job. And oh my God, I love it. This this takes a little bit of being patient with your brain at first because you know, the way our brains decide, decide what's important is entirely based on a survival mechanism. And that survival mechanism is essentially if, if something happens a lot, I'm gonna get good at it. Right? Your entire body is built that way. If you have to pick up heavy things all the time, you're going to get good at it. If you have to do any type of cognitive activity a lot, you're going to get good at it. But you're not going to be good at it initially. So I had to be really patient with myself. It, it used to take me a couple days to write a chapter, like chapter seven. Now, 10 pages, I mean, a couple hours. But it's, wow. be, it's because I go to bed with this, my brain organizes the information I'm going to need and I wake up the next morning and I have a routine. I get my cup of coffee. I answer a couple emails. I sit down and I write the chapter and I turn off the distractions. I don't let things pop up in the middle of my day if I'm writing and it's done in a couple hours. It's no big deal because I'm only, I have to write a couple paragraphs about each one where I think people go wrong a lot. There's, there's a couple. One, you get into this, I need to teach all the things and you can't. Teaching, teaching is not a question of inventing new information. If you're inventing new information, you're not teaching, right? One second, Don. Yeah. We're having a, a lot of reports about, um, about an echo, and I am not hearing it from Skype. Yeah, and so I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, not terrible. Just noticing it. People can hear you. Okay. It's a, it's a millisecond or two of Don's voice. And I'm trying to... I'm listening to my environment and I don't think that I'm letting anything in. No, you know, it's, it's more likely jitter on the, the streaming connection. Interesting. Okay. So, so, so I'm not echoing, but you are. Yeah. So it, it would just be jittering getting, it getting to the upstream probably. Okay. Yeah. All righty. People said that it's tolerable. Yeah. Well, I, I we'll really love this information that you're giving because I see a lot of similarities, not between me and writing a book, but me and writing PowerShell, because I do allow myself that time to go to bed and, and think, uh, like, you know, I'll, 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 I'll read up and explore kind of a topic of, of solving a problem. And then I'll go to bed and I'll be like, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll have it better in the morning. And then by morning I'll have designed that. So it's super interesting that your brain does the same thing, just applying it, um, applying yeah, I, it to books instead. I mean, everybody's brain does that, right? It, it's part of how our brains work. If, if you, if you prepare yourself and your brain knows that this is what I'm going to be working on the next day, it will prepare itself. The reason a lot of us don't notice is that because our jobs are the same every day. We don't, I don't need to prepare myself to go flip hamburgers. So my brain already knows what to do for that. But if you want it to do something creative or different, you need to give a little yeah. heads up and give it time to put the synapses together on the back end. I am getting some questions from chat, from chat that I don't know if you can see chat, but I'd like to be able to ask them. Yeah, no, bring, you. Yeah, bring them in. Um, all right. So code with Sean said I'm plagued with, it must be perfect or not at all. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do yeah. you work out that? Oh, oh, sorry. That's another question. Okay. Go on. I, I disagree. Um, I don't think there is such a thing as perfect. I, I mean, I, I think, I think we're, we're all humans and we're all fallible. Like, look, I'll, I'll do a perfect example. Where is this book? Uh, this is on the PowerShell side. So this is actually a really good example. This is the very first PowerShell tool making book I wrote. And it is, it's not very thick. Um, See how many pages it is. This is about a six by nine trim size, and it's about 120 pages. And oh, wow. I wrote this while we were vacationing in Europe um, on my iPad, and I did all the code from memory. And, and it's not hard code. Like, that's, that's not impressive. Um, I sent it back to Jason Helmick, who tested the code for me, uh, for the most part, and, and we ran with it. So this is a little self-published book. Um, turns out it had some bugs had some errors. It's not perfect. Um, there's, you know, going back and looking at it later, there's a few bits of this, this narrative. Like I was, I was trying to do this thing where you start with a really simple function and then it, it gradually builds and you start adding features. And, and by the time you're done, you've got a full script commandlet. Um, and it, there's some bits I missed. There's some bits I wasn't real happy with. And so 
I went back and did it again, and this is the second version of that. This is the one I did with Manning, and it's much thicker. It's twice as long. It's a bigger trim size, too. Um, this is... Yeah, what up? I know that one. This is about 300 pages, and I got it much better, right? You're never going to get it perfect. Um, you know, and, and the, the best laid plans never survive first contact with the enemy, right? So it's, it's whatever you do, however perfect you think it is, it still isn't. And so why did you spend I, all I, that time? I think that what Sean is saying, he said, it's not that I believe in perfection. It's more about imposter syndrome. So I think that maybe what he's saying is that he's very self-conscious. And last night when yeah. I was writing on stream, I was like, I kept wanting to say, just so y'all know, this isn't the final. This isn't the final. Yeah. Because I was like, you know, it, whenever people it are judging comes you. out, it's very ugly. Yeah, yeah. you don't want yeah. people to judge you. Yeah, I mean the only the only thing I'll say for that is is I've got a lot of experience doing this. I've had a lot of experience being wrong, and I've become okay with it. Like I've just accepted that it's okay, yeah. and I've realized that other people aren't judging me all that harshly. Um, and the the real the real shame in the world isn't that you put out something that maybe had a bug or an error. The shame is that you didn't put out anything at all. Right. It, That's it, very true. Like yeah. the knowledge that isn't shared is the only knowledge that is wasted. So like, j you know, just, just do it, just get out there and do it. Um, I, I think the other thing that, that some folks will get wrapped up about is this idea that I've got to put everything in. And this is what I was saying before is teaching is not creating new information. Teaching is repackaging existing information for a particular audience. I could write four books on the same topic each for a slightly different audience. That's what I was talking about with that textbook earlier. I could write a, a, a great textbook on .NET framework programming, but to write one for high school students where the teacher doesn't need to know programming is a very specific package. And I do that in a very different way, and I'm not going to be able to get through as much because there's, there's more to that process than just me spewing a bunch of information. And so you really do have to, to triage and keep your audience in mind. Like, who are they at the beginning? Who do they need to be at the end? And what's the shortest way I can get them there, even if sometimes it means not fully exploring something, even if it means maybe glossing over a few details, right? Yeah. It's not the first yeah. book they're, even if it's the first book they're going to read, there's going to be another one after that and a website after that and a blog after that. Like this isn't the end of their learning experience. So you don't have to, you don't have to get it all in. That, that, that reminds me of something that I was told by Lee Holmes of the PowerShell team. Um, I was really excited about this script that I wrote called start SQL migration. And, um, and he was like, Chrissy, put it out in the PowerShell gallery. And I was like, no, it's yeah. not perfect. Yeah. And and he said it doesn't need to be. Um, you just have to put it out there. But man, he said it in like such a better way. That's very. It seems like you're resonating um, with the with the with the the visitors or the viewers here because Sean said, um, "Oh my God, I love that. This is um, this is really this information is just it's so it is gold." And whenever I talk to Lee. And he gave me permission, yeah, to be imperfect. And from there, like a lot of times, I would encourage other people to put their stuff in the PowerShell gallery and make it public. And uh, and they had those those hesitations at first as well. And I was like, hey, you can. It doesn't have to be perfect. And then and then they would be like, oh yeah, that's so true. Like it just has to be available. It has to be there for use. People are gonna find bugs and then you fix them and it kind of takes off from there. I'll, so I'll I, even, I can see how I'll, writing is very similar. I'll even go a step further and I I try to share those failures. You know, it's like not only was this not perfect, let me explain what I learned after I realized this was wrong. And, and that learning process, um, you know, some of it is just being a little vulnerable, right? Like for someone who's sharing something, it's such a big deal. If you can share something, go, oh, you know what? This was screwed up. And let me walk you through why that was screwed up and what I had to do to fix it. That's tremendously valuable. And it shows other people that it's okay to, to screw up and fail. It's how we all learn. And then sharing that actual learning process is incredibly valuable. I mean, that's, that's, 
really what life is all about is just, you know, skating from one mistake to the next mistake. If we were successful all the time, we wouldn't grow or improve. Totally. So you want to, you want to see one of my really, like what a full outline looks like? Yeah, actually. Uh, so Sean Melton had asked, he said, do you work the outline to this extent for the book proposal as well? Or is this a step after the book proposal has been approved? Um, normally it would be a step after the book proposal is, has been approved. Like once the publisher is, is generally on board with what you're doing, I have been self-publishing for so long and I've been doing this long enough that I usually do this up front. Um, yeah, I, I can more or less go to my publishers and say, look, this is the book I want to write. Here's the full outline, take it or leave it. If, if you don't want it, I'll self-publish. Um, do you, do you do it chapter by chapter or, oh yeah. or do you go through the entire book in one day? Like as you're doing the outline? Uh, no outline outline can take me a couple weeks. Like, like I, I can sit and do a really good first pass in a day, but after I sleep on it, I'm inevitably, Oh, you know what? I wanted to cover A, B, and C, but I can't do that unless I cover D first. So I'm going to have to go rebuild this thing so that D has a place to live. And maybe that means inserting a chapter. And you know what? Now this is really long. So now I've got to decide, like, I might not be able to get as far as I wanted to. Do I need to take some things out? The The first PowerShell um, Month of Lunches book doesn't do any scripting. None. It You literally do not write a script. It is it, there. There's not a PS1 file until the very, very end of it where it's just like, look, you can throw a bunch of commands into a PS1 file and you've got a script. Okay, end of book. Because that's as far as I could get given the parameters of what I wanted you know, someone's time commitment to be, which is why there, that's why there's a second book now, the tool making or scripting book. But um, mm -hmm, it, okay. it usually takes me a week before I'm comfortable with an outline. Is that a week of eight hours per day? No, no, or no, no, is no. it a week of like just dropping by, putting in a little something and then doing something else? Yeah, it, it's a bunch of hours at, at first and then it's it's revisiting it multiple times. Um, but but no, it's it's not a it's not a full day every time. That would be I'd, I'd drive myself nuts and everyone around me. <laughs> What do you do for eight hours? Do you work eight hours per day as an author? Um, on days when I'm authoring? No. Yes. No. I I really, if, if I'm writing, I can't. Um, I'm good from about the time I wake up until, until lunchtime. And then a, an hour or two after lunch is maybe going back and rereading to make sure that what I wrote came out right and, you know, just doing some editing and, oh, that, that sentence doesn't make any sense or that paragraph really should be over here. Um, but that's, that's it. I have had occasions where I've had to push myself. Um, you know, again, I was independent and I was making my money writing. And so there were times when I had to push out, like I had to write for 10 hours in a day. Um, and it's, that's really Whoa. tough for me. And it means I, I'm pretty much no good for the next couple of days. Like it's, it, it, it gets really brutal. Like, you know, from, from seven or eight, when I get my cup of coffee and I start up until 1230 lunchtime, whatever, I can write pretty continuously. Like to the point where, mm -hmm. you know, Chris can hear me abusing the keyboard cause I'm a really heavy typist. And, uh, <laughs> I learned to type on a Commodore 64 and I can't be fixed. And, you know, he'll bring me a little yes. snack and then I'm, I'm continually writing. And then once I, like I, I will hit a wall and I know that that's enough for today. That's it. After that, totally know that wall. if I have to force myself, it's really hard. It's 10% as productive. Like it, it takes me an hour to hammer out a paragraph. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm at the sex, I'm at that, that point where it does take me an hour for I, maybe four hours for a paragraph. And, um, Whenever I'm, you know, if, if for whenever I'm live streaming, I'll talk through that thought process and it is, it's, it's jumbled, it's tortured. Is there, would you be able to write a paragraph for us on some topic and, and talk through, um, what is going through your head and, and, and like we could watch it all happen. Yeah. So let's, let's take this one. So let's take this first subsection here. Um, my time flip. 
So let me make a new, no, that's not how you make a new doc. Too many keyboard shortcuts. All right. So let's see here. Uh, I'm going to try and zoom the font up a lot so we can. Hell yeah, here we go. What's the uh, the editor that you're using? This is just pages. Uh, I don't do most of my writing in pages, pages but right. yeah, it's, it's pretty minimal for something like this, so. Uh, Mr. Zinu asks, is that the cube that you flipped to change your timer? I legit wanted one of those and yeah. couldn't justify the cost. Yeah, okay. it is. So, I mean, that might be a, a an opening paragraph in that particular sub-bullet. So, from what I can tell, as I'm reading this, it just sounds like you're talking to me. Yeah, I do. I, I write very much and, like and I talk. And so, in your head, right. And so, in, in your head, are you having a conversation with someone? Um, yeah, you know, I was... See, I'm, I'm already editing, right? So here, here's what happens. <laughs> I, I am just talking. I am writing like I talk, but in written form, like this comma doesn't go there, right? So my editor would have to fix that. And, and that's the point is, is what I'm writing isn't perfect. It, it needs editing. It, it, needs, it needs work to make it more written. But I learned to teach by being a classroom trainer, right? That I was standing up in front of people and teaching. And, you know, when you're teaching people, you have to kind of work out what your stories are going to be and your analogies and the things that are going to help them understand the concepts that they're getting. And I do all of that in my head. I also never went to college. I don't have a degree. And so I was never in college technical writing class or college writing class. And so I was never taught to write the way you're supposed to do it, which is, in fact, not the way you're supposed to do it. Um, the biggest compliments Absolutely. I have ever gotten... Um, and it's happened a couple of times. People have come up to me at, at Tech Ed or something like that and said, you know, I've, I've read your books and you talk just like you write. And now when I read your books, I'm going to hear your voice. And, mm -hmm. and it's a huge compliment. And it's exactly what I want because I'm just trying to, I'm trying to talk to a person. I'm trying to talk to you, the person who's reading this. And, and I do want to, I, I want to talk just like I write. I don't want to make it overly formal. Um, I, I will have editors uh, you know, they'll go back and they'll they'll take out some of my apostrophes, my contractions, and I will go back and say, no, I don't talk like that. Put the, put the contraction back in. Um, there's certain idioms and things that, depending on the audience I'm writing for, like if it's Manning, they have a global audience, and so they'll, they'll call me out on certain idioms that are extremely U.S.-centric, and they'll say, look, can we come up with something different? Totally. Like, yeah. But when I'm writing, I don't worry about that. I'm not, I'm not trying to produce perfection in the text the first time through. I'm just trying to get the message down. Then we can go back later and do edits. That's fine. That's why God made editors. Um, so I, I just, I want to get it down. And I type very stream of conscious. Um, that's why it's important for me to have such a detailed outline or I will absolutely go off on weird tangents, right? But with a very detailed outline, I know what I'm writing about and I can stick with that. Um, and then, you know, pumping out a paragraph is it turns out to not be that big of a deal. It's just like, you know, if you walked into my office and said, what's that little thing on your desk? Oh, well, it's a time flip. What do you use that for? Well, and it's that conversation. I absolutely love that. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to do it myself. I do find that I, I think that it's the judgment that's happening. Um, am I, you know, including like a formal definition? Um, <sighs> Yeah, I mean, you you can oh, get all that stuff in in post production, right? Okay. Like, yeah. Writing is the easiest thing in the world yeah. to edit, 
And so get the message out. And, and I will, um, you know, I, I, I just, I was doing some um, edit reviews this morning and, and I used a phrase and my editor highlighted it, put a comment and said, is this something that everyone in the audience automatically knows or should you define it? I'm like, oh, you're right. I, I should. So, you know, whatever the word is, um, you know, I would, I'll add that in just to explain what that meant and then go on. So there's going to be an editorial pass. There just is. Uh, if you're self-publishing, you can mm -hmm. hire an editor to do that for you. If you're working with a publisher, they will have an editor who does that for you. Um, most publishers actually have a couple of editorial passes. People don't realize that. You'll start with a development editor, and their job is to just help make sure you're keeping a good narrative and a good sequence and that you're explaining the things that need to be explained and that it's all clear. Then you've got a copy editor who's going to go back and fix your apostrophes and your commas and your your grammar and your spelling and all that kind of crap. And then you've got like a whole other set of editors that are, are actually putting it into the right format who might ask, you know, can we break this word here so that the line stays even? Like there's a bunch of passes on a professionally published book. There's also with Manning, they have the the technical. Well, I don't know about for your books, but yeah. for my books, I love the questions that they ask. Yeah. Um, they'll send it out to like eleven people and say, "Would you give this five stars on yeah. Amazon? And if not, why not?" And that's exactly. I'm like, that's exactly what I want to know. Yeah, yeah, because I I want to make this the best book, and so it is. Uh, it is incredible with Manning just how many editors we get. We get the person who writes the front of the book in the back of the book we get the marketing yep. person we get the development editor and I, I noticed that you and I have the same editor do you whenever she sends your draft back and it has all of her comments first is it a is is it probably as many comments as mine and second it's, um it's probably more how long does it how long does it take you to respond to those? Because like, I know that for me, I actually calculated this out. It takes 24 hours to write a first draft. And then once she sends her comments back, depending on how much it'll probably take another eight hours. So I'm going to, so I told you I, I did this manuscript. I did the outline once and then I had to fix it. Mm -hmm. What I didn't tell you is I actually wrote almost the entire book. And it wasn't until we started going through edits that I realized that this outline was not working, even though I'd already written most of the book. Um, I'm just, I'm going to pull up a random chapter here. This is chapter two. Nope. She might not have done that one yet. Let's, let's see if I can find one where she edited. If not, I'll go into the current manuscript. No, I think, I think I may have deleted the ones that she edited because I, I will be honest with you. Um, edits stress me the hell out. They make me anxious when I know why is that I don't know I hate being questioned on things I guess um, ah. yeah like we've already these uh, so there's there's still a few in here this one didn't have a ton it's a small chapter um, when I get a batch of edits back I will I will ignore it for three or four days um, so I mean yeah there's there's a bunch of stuff in here, you know, and it's, it's like career killer was ambiguous. So, so she, she had made, made a suggested, suggested change and I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Um, you know, Chris is the the tech editor who's going through here and, and this isn't a technical book, but he's a technical person. So um, <laughs> this was a, just a stupid typo I made. And she's like, I don't understand the sentence because the typo doesn't make sense to me. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> This isn't that long of a chapter. It's five pages. I get so deeply stressed out and anxious that I, I, I can't look at them. And then I have to be like, okay, today's the day. I'm just going to knuckle down and do this. And I'm, I'm completely bent out of shape. I will almost always do it in the afternoons because I tell myself when I'm done, I can have a whiskey. Um, like if it, <laughs> and it winds up not stressing me out that much to do it, but I, I, it builds to this enormous thing in my head. And I've always been like that. I have been like that so much. I will tell you a secret. I wrote a book called e-commerce for dummies. I wrote it with two co-authors. There were three of us. Um, one of them was really just there. He was an analyst. And so he was just there to provide us with some data. So he wasn't really an author, but that was the deal is he got co-author credit. 
the other author didn't write a single word of the book. I wrote 100% of the book, and he dealt with the editors. Because I am, I get so stressed. You can ask. Oh, wow. You can ask Francis. So that, that's our, our, our dev editor at, um, at Manning. You can ask her, and she can tell you how much I get stressed out and how, how rude I can be, and I just I hate the process. Um, the PowerShell Month of Lunches book, I wrote the entire manuscript, sent it to Hicks, Hicks added a whole bunch of stuff of his own, and he dealt with the editors. That was our deal. He did all the editorial passes. Um, I love having co-authors if they will deal with the editors for me. I'm, I'm that bad. What exactly is it that, that stresses you out? Is it... Oh, it's a bunch of stuff. It, I, it, I, I hate having discussions and comment threads in Word, for one. Mm -hmm. That... Yeah. I, I can't can handle that. that. I, I don't like the whole, I don't know, it's, you know, can you rephrase this? No, that's the phrase I want to use. Who, well, yeah, but it makes it sound like you're talking about something horrific. Y you know what? Move. You should know better. I just, I get that very IT help desk guy thing in my head where it's like, how dare you question me? You know, this is my baby. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, some of it is ah, also, yeah. some of it's also like, no, I've read this. I, I wrote this, then I read it, and I'm done with it. I don't want to look at it anymore. It's in my past. I'm, it, let's move on. I don't want to go back and forth through oh, this again. interesting. Yeah. I, yeah. I have real I, attitudes see, about whenever, editing. Whenever I submit my chapter, I'm like, oh, my God, Francis is going to be so proud of me. <laughs> this actually came out good. I answered her questions. Why? 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 Because she always asks me, you're like, why, Chrissy? Why? And then she's like, put that in your book. <laughs> and then so I'll send it. And then I will get so many comments back. Yep. And she, she is nice because she piles the like, this is a great chapter. It highlights blah. Here's where it's, you know, really amazing. And then like, here's all the stuff that, that you need to change. Um, but then whenever I rewrite it after that eight hours and I'll send it back, I'm like, now that is a great chapter. And, and so like, I actually enjoy that part of the process. Um, but at the same time, I am a new author and I'm sort of like looking at, at Francis as, um, like, I feel like I'm a programmer and she's a writer and I want to be like that. Well, yeah. And that, that's her job. Um, and so she, I, I do. Yeah. She's really yeah. good at that. I, I, I a lot of writers, and, and I know a lot of people who write, and a lot of writers are so delicate, and they're just like me, uh, maybe not as bad. But I, I like the, the, the ego delicacy of an eight-year-old, right? So for my fiction books, I hire a, a, a proofreader because I self-publish. And I found a woman named Emma. Her website is emeraldinkediting.com. And if you need a proofreader, she's awesome. Because when you get your chapter back, and even with that, even with that, I know she's mainly just going to be catching typos. Like, she's... She's not trying to restructure the narrative of a fiction novel, for pity's sake. But even that, I get stressed out. I'm like, okay, okay, here we go. I, I have to psych myself up for it. But her comments are like, this was so fascinating. This really, really grabbed me, and it's so charming, and I love it so much because I, it, that's why I like her, because she strokes the writer's ego enough that I can get through the process. And that's like how delicate I am about it. I'll, I'll show you one of my, one of my novel yeah. outlines. This is how. All right. This is how insanely detailed I get. Hey, you're prolific, and you have so many books. With all of the books that you've written, have you ever been confronted at a conference by someone who hates your book? Um. Oh gosh, I've gotten some. Ter I'm, I have to look at the books. Now. I've got some terrible comments on Amazon, which is kind of similar. Um. Oh, that, that has got to be that. I am terrified of that. Yeah. I just don't look, I, I just don't look, just, you can't look at them. Um, I don't, I don't think at a conference, no, but definitely, definitely in go, writing, Sean. definitely in writing. Yeah. Don't worry, Sean. You only have to worry about Amazon. Yeah. Just, <laughs> and just don't look. Just like you're better you off know not what knowing. I, love, though? I will say like, I have that meep out. And, and I, I, you know, whenever I was first putting out the chapters, I was like, oh God, like people are just going to get so pissed that I'm a first time shitty writer. 
And then we get such wonderful comments yeah. back like, oh, you know, I'm a systems engineer and this helped me understand SQL and I'm a SQL person and this helped me understand PowerShell. And and then I was like, oh, 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 people actually enjoy that. So I think uh, Sean was highlighting how he actually has created in his mind a response to being confronted at a conference. I don't think but it'll I ever think happen. that once you put it out there, yeah, yeah it's not going to happen, Sean. And also you'll be delighted by the responses that you get to your book. Um, so far, I that's been my experience that I've been tortured with. Oh my God, people are going to hate this. And then they end up really like liking it. Um, Oops. Uh, I'm, he's also asking for the link to Emerald Inc. Oh yeah. Would you um, be able to type that in the chat? I don't know if you have the chat. Open. I don't, I don't have the chat open. Oh, that's obviously not. Okay. So, well, Emerald Inc. Editing.com, although account suspended. So that's not good. Maybe she's not paid for her website hosting. Um, but if, if you DM me on Twitter, I can send you her email address. Alrighty. Uh, what is this? What is this book called? Um, special edition using. I'll see if I can find one. Yeah. This is one of mine. Five ratings. So some of this is going to be horrible. Here we go. Not the best book. The only book. Um, the structure of the book is awkward. There's no introduction to the CS architecture with an explanation of, of various, various objects. objects. It is up to the reader to notice an object being used to figure out if it's an interface from existing online documentation. The book is a little more than a rehash of the existing online documentation, just a little easier to sift through. Um, if you're doing CS 2002 site, this book is for you because it's the only book out there. <sighs> That's from 2003. Yeah. That was, that was a little tough. But I mean, then on the other hand, you've got people who are like, you know, a fast read packed with information, a must read. Like, you know, it's what I said earlier, teaching of any kind is, is packaging information for a specific audience. Sometimes someone from the wrong audience is going to pick up the book and that's okay. Yeah. Like it wasn't for them. It's fine. Uh, you know, People who are experts in PowerShell aren't going to enjoy my month of lunches books because it wasn't written for them. It's not going to do them much. Now, is, is somebody going to com confront me at a, a conference? No. I mean, honestly, you know, the anonymity of the internet is still pretty powerful. Like people will, will take you to town so true. on the internet, but they won't. Like people aren't going to get in your face about it because they really like, like just, you know what, get a refund. If you, if you didn't like it, return it. That's fine. Like you don't need to crawl up my butt about it. And I think people get that. Um, you know, the internet just gives people a platform to be mean sometimes. And you have to just either get a thick enough skin that it doesn't bother you or just ignore it, which is what I try to do most of the time. Um, I, you I, know, I, I guess, oh, go on, sorry. I, I, I actually sometimes will have friends go read my book reviews and then like give me yes. an honest, <laughs> like tell me if there's anything there that I need to read. Right. I've totally done that with other stuff. I, um, I'm totally crushed because if you go to Manning's website, my book has like a 3.9 and it's because somebody enjoyed the content so much that they wanted more faster. But yeah. during the pandemic, I wasn't writing because there's a pandemic. Yeah. And, uh, and so they gave me a one and it kills me because as I'm live streaming, people are like, oh, you're writing a book. And I, and I kind of don't want to go to Manning's site because I have shitty reviews already. Yeah. Um, but at least, at, at, at least it's prepared me. And at, at least it's not about the content, but is anybody going to say, oh, well, why did they rate her book low? You know, they're just going to assume that it was a shitty book. I, I will often ask for peers to just give me a private rundown. Like I've, I've paid before. I've, I've gone to people who were peers in the industry, you know, with the PowerShell book, it was a couple of people at Microsoft and, and, you know, guys like Tobias Veltner and, and folks like that and said, you know what, well, look, I'll, I'll send you a hundred dollar Amazon gift card. If you just, if you read this and just give me an honest, you know, one page set of thoughts, because then at least mm -hmm. I know I'm getting something that's, that's, it's useful it's not driven by an ulterior motive. And if they're like, yeah, you know what? Right. It's, it's fine. I really appreciate it. I see where you're going. It's not my book. I, I don't need to read this, but I see where you're going. I think this will be really, really useful. And like anything else that happens, happens. Like once you put your stuff in the public, you can't, 
you can't control it, but that shouldn't be a reason not to put it in the public. Like you have to do that anyway. Without a doubt. I, um, I am really happy that I get the opportunity to write the, the book content, by the way. So you are in addition to an author, you're also a, is it a content developer? Like you literally wrote the, the outline for the, uh, in a month of, uh, in a, let's see, in a month of lunches oh, I, series, right? I developed the series guy for, yeah. So month of lunches was my series. I had the trademark on that. I pitched it to Manning. Um, they agreed to pick up the series I was a paid series editor for that for a while. Um, so yeah, I, I developed the whole format of that, um, which has a lot of cognitive science built into it, actually. Right? Yeah, it, you can you can tell because I was they gave me all of the documentation and I was like, this is so well thought out. Yeah. And that was something else that I'd wanted to talk to you about at some point was how how was that e like where does that even come from that you imagined a whole series format? Well, I'm, you know, I'll tell you, uh, that, that, uh, that shtick of book is not new. Uh, back in the day, Sam's had learned blah, blah, blah in 24 hours or learn blah, blah, blah. I have one here called um, Windows Server 2003 Weekend Crash Course. It's a 15-hour crash course. So there's a, you know, it, it, it's almost like the, the listicles, the clickbait of, you know, five things, the third one will astound you. People, people, yeah. people want to know that there's a, a minimum upfront investment and a guaranteed outcome. So you could write a book on learn it in 30 hours, learn it in 45 hours. It kind of doesn't matter if people know that if I put X into it, I will get Y out of it. And, and that's yeah. really powerful. You know, you see the diet companies, Nutrisystem and all those do the same thing. Um, it's a really powerful human need is to understand that this isn't some vague open-ended thing. Like if I do X, I will get Y. So, so that's where the month of lunches came from. And okay, what's a month got? Well, in terms of working days, 20-ish days. So we're talking 20 hours of learning now. Um, so the month of lunches was just kind of a, 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 a cool phrase that me and a bunch of friends came up with. But I wanted to do something in 15 to 30 hours. And we came down to 20 because that was a month. And you would learn it during your lunch time, which is your time. So about an hour, which practically speaking means 45 minutes. And so I did some research on what the average reading speed is. Um, it's about, you know, 700 words per minute or something like that. So that tells me how many words each chapter is going to be. I need a little bit of time at the end for them to go through some exercises. So I'll, you know, I'll back off 15 minutes or whatever and come up with the exercises at the end. And, and it turns out that there's a lot of cognitive science that aligns with that. Most, most humans can only really engage in useful formal learning for about an hour a day, um, especially once you're an adult. And it has a lot to do with the other cognitive loads that sit on our brains all day long. So about an hour or two, but I figured I'd err on the side of caution and go for an hour. And, and it's that same thing. Um, I, I'll get emails from folks still like, oh yeah, I blew through the book in a week, but you know, I'm, I'm reading it again. Yeah. If, if you'd have just done the one chapter a day thing, you'd be fine. But uh, yes, because you, totally. you need to read it. You need to do the exercises and then you need to go to bed and let your brain create the synaptic networks and find the other things to connect to. If you load too much on it in a given day, it actually can't connect all those things to things you know, so it can't create context and it doesn't create powerful memories. So like we all want to learn faster, but we've got meat brains in our skulls and that's all it does. Like that's what we're stuck with. And so it makes a lot more sense to just understand how it works and why and go with that rather than trying to, you know, hack it or something like that and, and do, but you're not gonna, it's, it's a trillion year old machine. It's only going to do what it's going to do. That is so important and helps me set expectations for myself because a lot of times like I'll open up a book and I can only get through one chapter, then I'm all disappointed because I know people that can read like a book in two days. Um, but I guess the style of book that I read is the, is the style of book that you write, which is something that you're learning from. So yeah. thank you. That might, that might've actually changed my life. So I appreciate yeah. that. Um, it helps me. I love managing expectations. I do have a question that just came up, which is how do you keep yourself on beginner books and content from getting too technical in writing? Uh, one of those, we may have been doing it so much and we've forgotten what it's like at the beginning to remember the little details that helped make that click to happen uh, to understand it. That, that's exactly it is we all forget. 
we all forget how it was. And the other thing that I will see technical people do, which is a huge mistake, uh, is they'll, they'll start out with like, okay, first I need to explain all the concepts up front. And it's, it's right. terrible because it's not how brains learn. Like, you know, no one sat you down and said, okay, you're five and we're going to talk about thermodynamics. Well, why? Well, because I'm going to put a hot pot of water on the stove and I don't want you burning yourself. So we're going to start with thermodynamics. It's not going to work, right? Our brains don't learn that way. So we can only learn concepts at the exact moment that we're about to put them to use. And so what keeps me from going too deep or too technical are the limits I put around myself. It's, this is going to be a 30 chapter book. Each chapter is going to take about an hour to read. Right there, I'm only going to be able to get so much done. And so I've got to decide, given who my audience was at the beginning and who I want them to be at the end, what is the minimum amount of information I need to give them to get them from point A to point B, knowing that later in their lives, there will be point C, D, E, F, and so on. I don't need to, I don't need to swallow the whole ocean right now. What's the best foundation I can give them? I only write, at least in the latter part of my career, I've only written entry-level stuff. And it can be a little confusing for people. And I'll, I'll have this conversation with them. I say, you know, you th- you think I'm a PowerShell expert? Well, well yeah, I'm, I'm not. There's tons of people who know way more about PowerShell than I will ever know. You think I'm an expert because I was the first one who taught you anything about it, and so you assume I know all the things. But I don't. I'm just really good at explaining the basics. That's it. And and you kind of have I- to embrace that. You know, yeah, it seems like over and over, basically, it's acceptance, acceptance, acceptance. Yep. Yep. We've, we're, we, we live in a meat world of physics, and, and there's things we can't change, and there's no sense trying to change them. You, you just need to roll with what you've got. Like, we, we're all equipped with this instrument in our skulls that can only do certain things so fast, and, and you've just got to accept that and accept that you're going to get it wrong. Like, look... Power Selling a Month of Lunches, a lot of people have read that book, like a lot. It's one of Manning's bestsellers, and I'm really, really proud of that because it's helped a ton of people, and I'm really proud of that. It was the fifth PowerShell book I wrote, and I look back at the table of contents for the first one, which again, right, teaching is packaging. The first PowerShell book I wrote was written for a VB script programmer because that's who the first logical audience was. Completely different table of contents. I'm not proud of that book. I'm not proud of it at all. Um, I'm only slightly prouder of the second edition of that. It wasn't until we got to the third edition, I'm like, okay, I see where this is going. But then I quit writing books. After the the third edition of PowerShell TFM, I said, I'm not going to write any more PowerShell books. I'm done. I don't want to do it. Everybody's written one. Every, every publisher is in the game now. There's, you know, 11 dozen stupid PowerShell books out there. That's fine. People kept coming to me and saying, well, what do you recommend? I'm like, well, here's the thing. I've looked at the table of contents on all of them, and I don't like any of them. Like, they're, they're still all written for a per. They've all got you programming by chapter three. That's not, like, that's not how the human brain is going to get into PowerShell if it's never been anywhere else first. And so that's when I finally right. decided to, to do the Month of Lunches series. Just so you know, we had a, a comment from Sean, who's uh, also writing a book on microservices for A-Press. He said, wow, so much pressure is being lifted off of my chest listening to Don. Good. And I, I totally agree. I think that it was pressure that had me just sitting and staring at, at, at a paragraph and not being able to go forward. And I was actually going to ask you what happens in your brain as you're staring at a, at a at a paragraph and you can't move forward. But I imagine the answer is that you don't because you aren't judging yourself and you're just going with it. Yeah, I I really don't. I don't get writer's block. I never have. I mean, outlining is a huge piece of that. Like I have to know what I'm going to be writing. But I mean, that's... Which is... So that's that's why I wanted to pull this up. So this is one of my fiction books. And I I think this is a, a helpful... It's a helpful exercise because it takes your brain away from technology. And I outline my tech books this same way. And if you look at this, um, I'll, I'll blow this up a little bit. So it's. Oh, this is awesome. Yeah. These are all this bullet list is, is a list of shit that has to happen in that chapter in order to carry the story forward. Now, if you think about teaching something in technology, you're telling a story to someone and that someone should be the reader and the reader should be the hero. 
And every hero has a journey. They begin their journey not good enough to accomplish their, their grand destiny. And by the end of the book, they have accomplished their grand destiny and they have a little bit of an idea of what's next, right? That's the hero's journey. And my job is to guide them through that journey and to tell their story. And that means in each chapter, certain things have got to happen. Like if it's a PowerShell book, okay, like first of all, I've got to make sure you know where some of the, like what are the first things that are going to trip you up? You got to install the thing and get it running. Okay, that's first. And I start to sequence that out. Oh, you know what? I, I can't teach you about pipelines because I haven't taught you about this first. So I need to rearrange those so that I'm never referring forward and I'm never referring backward. Each step is literally a step on the journey. You can't take step five until you've taken steps one, two, three, and four. And so I sequence all those things out. And this is what my tech outlines look like. It, they're not fancy. It's just a list of, sh list of shit I need to cover in this chapter. Like these things have to happen so that the next chapter will make sense. And as I'm writing, it's, oh, oh, you know what? I need to go back and put this in chapter one. Chapter one is looking a little heavy now. I may need to split that up and sequence these things out between those. But this becomes, I call this blocking because it's not really outlining. I actually do a second step, which is the outline. And it's, it's where I make sure these things are all in the right order and I, I really get more detailed about what I'm going to write about. But this first step of, of blocking is this is the journey and these are the things that happen to the hero along every single step of that journey. And I can go through this whole thing and you see everything that happens to these characters. And I've, you know, I, I keep track of what's happening to them and where they are and who they're talking to and what the different arcs are. There will be an outline after this, but I, I did, this is exactly what I do with the tech books too, is I know what needs to happen in each chapter. And like once you've decided that, you know, I can't cover 10 bullets in 10 pages, I'm going to have to break this up. The, I mean, the book starts to come together really quickly and really easily. I totally, that happened to me for the first time last weekend. I decided to put the code that I needed to cover and, um, and then started filling in the blanks, answering the question, uh, why yep. instead of how. Yep. And so, yeah, this absolutely resonates so very much. And I do also love that you just said that you write some things out of order and you're like, Oh, well, let me go back and say that. Cause I was, I was judging myself for that. And I, I had talked about it on stream. I thought that it was my, um, I speak Cajun English, which is our parents spoke French. And so our, our, uh, our sentences are often backwards. Yep. And, and I was like, did my brain take that and start doing it to paragraphs instead? But it seems like that's the way that you think as well. And you just reorder it and it's no big deal. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I'm not shooting a movie, right? So once, once I know all the things, then I worry about, okay, what order do the things need to go into? And I'll get them in the right order. And then I'll decide if I need to split this out or not. You know what? You said writing the code first. That's what I did with the tool making book, um, the PowerShell scripting in a month of launches. I, I wanted this narrative of where there's a running example through the entire first part of the book where you start with a very simple single command. And then that evolves into a function, which gets parameters. And so at the end of those were the chapters, each step along the way, Okay, well, I want to add this to it. Now I want to add, oh, wouldn't it be nice if it had built in help? Okay, that's the next step. And, and each step yeah. I would kind of end with, you know, this is great, but, but that computer name is hard-coded. It would be great if we could parameterize that. Chapter three, parameterizing, boom. So you get a great little narrative. It's a story. And, and it's very much the way that most people wind up approaching this is they, you know, you deal with the problem that's in front of you and then either you create a new problem or you're like, oh, but what if, and you want a little bit more and that's the next step. And you just, you go through that journey. It's not efficient, right? And I think that's the thing that writers have to remember in technology is you can't make the brain more efficient. The brain has to experience what it has to experience. I cannot just start out with a fully fledged script commandlet and go, okay, let me explain all these different pieces to you. That's not teaching. That's a reference guide. And that reference, yes. reference guides are useful, but it's not teaching. I'm not introducing you to the problem. I have to let you experience the problem first. And so every one of my chapters, my final outline, the first thing is, what is the problem? How are we solving it? Because I'll start with talking about the problem. 
you know, when you walk into a bar and blah, 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 and everyone can, oh yeah, yeah, I can relate to that. That is a problem. I'm invested in this. I understand what we're going to solve now. Then I can walk you through the solution. I can't just chuck a solution up and go, hey, this is great when that's not how human beings experience time, right? We never experience the effect before the cause. We always have the cause first. And so you you write that way. You present it that way. What is the cause? Why am I here? What is this even doing? And if, if everything is cause and effect, problem, solution, and then that leads to the next problem, solution, and that leads to the next problem, solution, that's the hero's journey. That's how the person experiences it. It doesn't have to be efficient. It has to teach, and those are different things. Ooh, these are some good notes. Taking them right now. <laughs> I mean, if you think about efficiency, we would never make kids go to 12 years of primary school, right? That's super inefficient. But we do it because that's how brains learn. Okay. Does anybody have any questions or did you want to go further into it, Don? No, you know, I think think those are a lot of my, my writing tips. Um, I'm scrolling through this other novel here because I, I do this too. I, I just make tons of unordered notes, and then later I will literally go through this this, and I will. Once I have something properly handled, I'll put a check mark next to it here in the outline so I know. Okay, I've got that. So this is my version of a mind map, I guess. This is all the things I think <laughs> I need to cover, but and then I get into the actual outline. But um. I- Outlining is just so. We just got a question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Outlining is so tremendously important for me. It's everything comes down to that because that's where I scope myself. That's where I put limits on myself. That's where I decide who the hero is. I decide what the journey is, what the grand destiny is at the end of it. Like all of that happens in outlining. I I can't sit down and write a word unless I've got that and I've done it, and the result is not great. The result is haphazard. It's a little all over the place. If you go back and look at the first edition of, of Be the Master, it, it's a little it's a little loose, uh, and it's because I didn't outline it first. I just I started stream of conscious singing, and that's only so effective. We have actually a number of questions that are coming in, um, and somebody asked, or Sean Melton asked, uh, "Do you think that your teaching background has helped in writing books?" Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. You when you're in a classroom you you become extremely aware of time constraints. You become extremely aware of the, the fatigue in people's faces when you, you go too long. You, you really become aware of, you know, look, I need, to, I need to have a story here to make this make sense. Like I can't just spew facts for eight hours a day. I've got to put them in some context. Uh, all of that is tremendously useful. And, and you know, I was teaching Microsoft official curriculum and they don't give you any of that in the book. Like it's on the, the teacher to make up the analogies. And if, if I was to just sit and read through a Microsoft official curriculum book that was supposed to last for five days, it would probably take a day and a half because the, the, wow. there's not that much information. All the rest of it is the delivery. Right. The, uh, and as I'm as I'm listening, and and somebody just came in and said, I came in halfway, and I need to sit down and rewatch this entire stream. I love this so much. As a technical writer myself, it hits on so many of the pain points I've felt through the years. Is it possible? This is my question. That you can write a, a book about writing <laughs> tech books? Because I'm like thinking, I'm like, man, can Don make this into a podcast series? Because I could listen all day, um, and you know, I'm making these notes, but I am going to have to rewatch this stream myself because there's been so many important points that are in it that I feel almost free. And I, I hope that whenever I go back to writing on stream, that that I'll be able to to look at it, like you said, as a journey with a hero, instead of uh, my brain was really trying to put out uh, a reference guide. Yeah. But and then I was battling it with the stories yep. and making sure that I keep the voice of, uh, of the or the intent of your book uh, series, the month of lunches. And so, yeah, that, that was my question. Can you make a book? And then also code with Sean says any storytelling tips and outline tips. So 
I probably can't write a book now. I my intent, and it, if my Twitter handle is at concentrated on my intent, and I'll announce it on Twitter, is to do a free writing workshop series. I'll probably do it with Zoom so I can have a little bit more fake Heck interaction yes. with people. I do not do well with the books until I have done a couple of live deliveries and I've gotten my I've gotten my story down. Um I'm like, I'm really famous for some of the little one-liners I pull off when I teach PowerShell. That happened over years of, of development. You know, the, the bit about every time you use right host, God kills a puppy. That, that came mm-hmm. out of a live class because I had seen people doing this. I'm like, okay, I need to nip this in the bud, but I need to nip it in the bud in a way that I don't have to explain it because we're really early on. And I see people just using right host because they've seen it online. And I, I want to stop them, but I don't want to explain why just yet because that I'm not going to get there yet. So I, I need to do something really profound. So I said, okay, I want everyone to take out your take out your, your paper, get your pen. All right, write down the following because it's really, really important. You've got to remember it. So I want you to write it down right on the cover of your notebook there. Right? Every time you use right host, and I would watch them all write it down. God kills a puppy. Write it down. Write it down. And it becomes this huge sticking point for people and they take it on faith at that point because I made a joke out of it. And then later I can explain why that's important. But I can't do that, like I have to do that a few times with with humans before I can figure it out. So I'm hoping that by doing this writing workshop, I can start to get a good a good story shtick down. And then, yeah, I mean, the book's not a terrible idea. I, I like to write, so why not? Heck Yeah. What was the other one? Storytelling techniques. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I am. Um, analogies are super important. And I don't think people really appreciate the importance of an analogy. And I don't think people really understand that the reason it's okay to teach the same thing that someone else has already taught is because you're going to have different analogies. And your analogies are going to be meaningful to you and people like you. And my analogies might not be. Um, I lean on car analogies really heavily for programming topics. Uh, given a running start or in anything, I can't explain using a car analogy. But if you come from a, a world or a culture where cars just aren't a big deal, like maybe you don't own a car or not a lot of people around you own cars, my analogies aren't going to be really effective. They kind of rely on you knowing what a car is at a really detailed level. Like I know what an engine is. I know the difference between, you know, an I4 and a V6 and all that stuff. So other people's analogies are important and, and analogies need to be relatable. The whole point of them is to not be wholly accurate. All analogies fall apart at a certain level of detail. The idea is to create context between something someone knows and something that you're trying to teach them. And so you use the word like and the word as, and you use similes and those those come together to form a little story. Um, telling stories about your own experiences, especially your own failures, are, are some of the best stories, even if they're lies. And that's really important. The value of a story is not in its truth when it comes to teaching. The value of a story is in its effectiveness. And so if you need to make up a story about your life, because it's not just a story that happened to someone else, right? It's a story that happened to you, the teacher. And that, that's a moment of vulnerability. And it shows your learners, it shows your students that it's okay to be vulnerable and it's okay to fail. Because look, this person's teaching me and they failed. And so it's got to be a story about you, but it doesn't have to be factual. It can be a lie. And that's fine so long as it, it creates that connection and it creates... The, the context and it creates that, that meaningful relationship so that whatever you're trying to teach can be related to folks. Stories are fantastic for stuff like that. Stories set up the problem and then you can share the solution with someone. Uh, you know, if, if I'm teaching, if I, so I used to teach SQL Server quite a bit back in the day and I used to teach performance tuning a lot and we would, you know, we would do these huge printouts and um, I had one client, they were a real estate client and they, their main database table set was addresses. So if you think about all the things that go into a street address, uh, there's, there's a lot, right? There's, there's maybe a street number, and then there's maybe a direction, like north or south, and then there's a name, and then it's street or avenue or boulevard or whatever, and then maybe another direction. Like, they get really complicated if you think about them all. So they, <laughs> they normalized 
all of that. And I mean normalized in a database sense. So for them to query a single address required them to join nine tables. <laughs> and I mean, SQL Server is fine with that. This was back in 2007 when nine tables was kind of a little bit over the limit for, for what Microsoft was telling you. And I'm like, guys, why did you, like, you know, the word denormalization is a thing, right? Like, well, you know, but this is totally normalized and that's best. I'm like, but it's not. Like, like we're not inventing new directions. You're, you're storing the direction north, northwest, south. You're, you're storing those directions. Oh, wow. In, in, in a var car field, and your 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 identity field is a freaking big end. And what's the point of normalization? Like, well, to reduce you know extra data and and wasted space. I'm like, you're storing like 27 bytes of data for two letters, man. You gotta stop. Like, just denormalize that shit, right? If you if you want to look up table to populate your UX so that people can't select a bad option, fine. But just put it right in the table, okay? Well, that story right there never actually happened to me, but it's a good explanation of why denormalizing is a thing. <laughs> I was totally into it and totally believing it. And that's how, you, that's how I explain denormalization to people. It's a common thing. We can all wrap our heads around that scenario. And it's a little bit of fun and it shows a failure and it lets me lead into the problem, which is sometimes it's okay to denormalize things. That went over well with the crowd. Love it. <laughs> I can't believe Don would lie to us like that. <laughs> Constantly. <laughs> All for a good cause, though. I actually, it, it, it is inspired by a true story, at least. Something, something very similar to that did happen to me. But um, that is a much more globally relatable version than what actually happened. We had somebody, uh, Corey said, last place I worked, we usually, we... Uh, heavily used tire shop analogies could be because we were a tire shop. So using sure. that analogy allowed us to put things into terms that literally anyone in the company could understand. And similarly, as you were talking, I realized that I use, um, uh, you know, whenever you're talking about the, the address and things like that, I use artists and track numbers sure. um, because one of my first databases that I designed was uh, was for a record company. Yeah. And that resonates because people know that they're buying an album and an album has tracks and the tracks each have a length and they have a title and they're written by someone. And so we kind of go from there. Yeah, except maybe a 15 year old who's literally never seen a CD or an album or a cassette tape and who only buys stuff on <laughs> iTunes. So true. Right. So it's, it's just about knowing your audience and that's, you know, people will say, well, you know, I, I don't really know what I, every, everything's already been taught. Yeah. But it hasn't been taught to every audience. And, and there's this weird biological phenomenon called a birth rate. And it means there's always new people coming up behind us who don't have the same context. Like I'm constantly wondering how long we can get away with the email icon being an envelope. Like, oh, yeah. like, like there have to be kids right now who are like, that's just an abstract pattern of lines. I have no idea what it actually, like it defeats the point of it being an icon other than that they've seen it their whole lives. And so they know what it means. So there's, you know, I've there's, seen that with diskettes for saving. Yep. That's the same one. Everyone's starting to get away from that now, especially now that we don't save things. Every just thing just lives in the cloud automatically all the time. But, mm -hmm. but, yeah, it's, it's, you know, icons are an analogy. That's what they are. They're meant to relate one thing to another thing. And, mm -hmm. and they're only good so long as you know your audience and that they're meaningful to your audience. So there's always room to reteach things to a different audience because everybody needs a new form of packaging. Thank you so much. Does anybody else in the, uh, in the chat have any questions for Dom? Is there anything else that you would like to teach us, Don? By the way, there was, we are super excited about the workshop, the Zoom workshop that you'll be putting on. Um, I, I think that that is, uh, it's going to be hugely popular. Yeah. So I need to look at my schedule. I'm kind of thinking end of Q1 is when I'll start. And, and I'm, I'm going to probably break it into like five or six bits and we'll do each bit for an hour. Um, and I'll, I'll have a sign up somewhere. But if, if, if you want to follow me on, on Twitter, I'll, I'll tweet about it. So that's at Concentrated Don. And the other thing I'll offer is 
I, I will probably use my my fiction book writing mailing list to like send out the links only because it's the only mailing list I have and I don't want to pay for another one. So if you want to be on that for the duration, it's at whichkind.com. W- here, I can type it in the, the window here too. W-I-T-C-H kind.com, um, which is the name of my series. And you can only have to sign up for the mailing list until the thing's over and then you can unsubscribe if you want to. It runs through MailChimp, so they'll unsubscribe you anytime you want. But that way, if you want to just get the announcement that I'm doing the thing and, and get all the Zoom links, uh, you can hop in and do that. And I, I think I can have 300 people, so I, I doubt we'll, we'll go over that. Um, but I will record it, and I'll stick the recordings up on my YouTube channel, uh, and then I'll put that on Twitter. So even if you can't make it live, uh, it, it'll be up there. But try and make it live. Uh, it'll just it'll be live sometime that's convenient for me in Pacific time. What is the link to your YouTube channel? Um, that is an interesting question. I think it's youtube.com slash PowerShell Dawn. That seems plausible. We just got somebody that said, Brabble said, best stream in 2020 to me. So (laughs) Wow. I know, right? That's awesome. awesome. Yep, that is is your link. Good. Yeah, so I'll, I'll stick it up there. And subscribe. Well, thank you so much. I totally appreciate your time. This has, uh, this has been so, so helpful for me. Oh, good. And I really, I hope that my brain can synthesize it because right now I have so much hope that the next time that I open my book, um, <laughs> that I'll just be able to just write stuff. But I also know, I don't know. I think that I have years of undoing to do. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, I think a lot of us probably do. I, I think I was fortunate in that, I, I kind of came to writing very informally and, and I, I didn't know a lot of what I didn't know. I mean, to the point where like the first book I wrote and th- this, this is embarrassing for people who speak English. Well, I would have my, my editor would highlight something and she would put, can you rewrite this in active voice? And I'm like, absolutely. What does that mean? And she, she was so patient with me and she had to explain active and passive voice. I'm like, oh, okay. She said, well, she said, you probably picked this up in, in college. I'm like, no, I didn't go to college. I just, I just picked it up by probably reading computer manuals. So I, I had no idea yes, there was a difference. Exactly. exactly. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's always stuff to unlearn. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Don. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share? No, no. Thanks so much for helping me set this up. I, I feel young again. I'm, I'm twitching and stuff. <laughs> it has been a total pleasure. Um, and I'm looking really forward to, uh, to rewatching the, the VOD and to probably upgrading. I want to sound like Don y'all, because that <laughs> is amazing. And I'll probably be getting that before December 31st. So thanks go. again, totally appreciate it. You and bet. you just have to hit that stop streaming button. We'll do it. <laughs> and you'll be set. You guys have a great week. Awesome.